Welcome back into another edition of the KSO Show. Mason Voth, KSU underscore fan, and Drew Galloway here with you on this Sunday edition as we recap the Cats' win over UCF last night, 44-31. to K-State gets the job done uh, in their second night game of the season. It'll be interesting to keep track of how many of those K-State gets this year. We already know that they're going to have a third one coming up in two weeks. It felt like I mean, I, I think uh, D.Y. said it last night. It, every road game last year basically was a night game except for the one at West Virginia, which was kind of a weird start time because it was ESPN Plus. And it was like East Coast, so you were dealing with like, I don't know, it was like 4.30 in the afternoon when it started over there. Very strange. Uh, but K-State might uh, have a few more primetime games in their sights, not necessarily because of how they've played, but how – they stack up relative to the rest of the Big 12, and we'll talk about that at the end of the show because I said it last night in the instant reaction. The Big 12 has more teams this year than it has ever had. They've got 14 teams, and I am confident in saying they have as few good teams as they've ever had in my lifetime, and that's since 1998. And I know that there were some pretty bleak years there in like the mid to late 2000s. The North had a lot of crappy teams, uh, but – it's bad right now. Texas is probably the only legit team. Everybody else, it's a it's a muddy mess, and we'll we'll dissect it a little bit later on. But the main focus is on the Cats, who, like I said, got the forty four to thirty one win. And uh, I'll, I'll let both of you just kind of start off with your immediate takeaways from last night's game, Drew. You can uh, you can be our speedy leadoff guy. Uh, I mean, honestly, my instant reaction, like I, I was thinking about this on my way home from Manhattan this morning, and I think that my instant reaction is that this this was a solid win. It, it isn't being celebrated like it was a solid win, but it, it, it was pretty solid. I mean, UCF is probably an upper half Big 12 team, maybe finish at like fourth, fifth, if if everything ended today. And that, and it was a 20-point game with six seconds left and got small down for all the timeout so they could score again. So, I, I mean, the, the defense had their struggles, but they – up until the garbage time touchdown, they'd only allowed seven points in the second half. The offense scored on every drive in the second half. Like it, it, it was just a solid game. And, and I feel like this is a game when you look back later on and later on and maybe in the off season, this is a game that will be celebrated more. But it, it just feels like there's a lot of like just talking like it, it just feels like if you read Twitter and read uh, KSO, like it, it just feels like K-State lost. So I feel like people need to put it like in perspective of this is one of the best teams K-State's going to play the rest of the year. And it was a 20 point game with six seconds left. Yeah, I would, I would echo Drew that uh, I think when you, when you look at this game, um, there, there were definitely frustrating moments. The defense struggled early. Uh, giving up the big plays kind of throughout the game. Um, Short that up much more in the second half, but still gave up a few big plays. The offense having the, another interception and then the, that late stretch of the second first half where they had three drives with no scores. I mean, the, those are frustrating things. But, you know, at the, at the end of the day, I look at what actually happened. K-State scored four points per drive, which is, you know, they've done that 28 times in 180 games since 2007 against FBS opponents. That's a top 15 percentage uh, uh, in that time span, you'll take that. They gained 64% of the yards available uh, based on down and distance. That's the top 30 mark out of those 180 games. So the offense ended up having a good game. Uh, sure, there were some missed throws and, and some mistakes, um, but we also saw the offensive line dominate a game, opening up holes for DJ Giddens, which we'll get to uh, for, for a huge rushing game for K-State. So a lot of good things on that side of the ball. Defense, I thought – I always think with Klanderman, there's games where we struggle, but he seems to always make the adjustments and, and at least shore up a few things so it's not ugly besides, you know, a couple games, Alabama last year maybe. Um, but I thought that happened tonight. We, we shored things up in the second half. We, we cut down on, on UCF's long drives and big plays and – they only scored to open the half, and then, and then, like Drew said, that that garbage touchdown at the end. So, some good things, and I do think uh, many of our fans, for some reason, underestimate UCF. I I thought they were the best of the new four coming into this game. I still think they probably are, 
the best of the new four, and I think they have the best chance of, of the new four of uh, finishing the top half of the league. So I think it will, like Drew said, will end up being a solid win. I think part of it is the uh, the backup quarterback situation yeah. for UCF. You, you kind of underestimate that. But, I mean, I, again, I heard it from the UCF fans in the, in the YouTube comments. They are very high and excited about Timmy McClain. And, I mean, he showed some things last night. Like, he, he's not the easiest guy to deal with. Um, and, and, you know, defensively for K-State, you still have a bunch of young or inexperienced guys in the secondary, and you're going to have growing pains with that. And, I mean, you get burnt by it, but at the end of the day, it feels a little bit different than the Missouri game defensively where it seemed like just repeatedly Missouri was able to get that big play. Really, it's it's like three of them that stick out in this game for UCF. It's the flea flicker. It's the quarterback draw on third and long. It's the screen that turned into a touchdown on third and long. Like it didn't, it, UCF needed those to make stuff happen. Missouri, it felt like even though they got some big pickups, there was a little bit more of a sustained nature and the K State defense was having to work harder. And to what you say about Joe Klanderman fan, I, I would compare him to uh, the first car that I ever had. It was like a 2004 Chevy Silverado. And, you know, I, my dad, a very frugal man, uh, always sitting in the nosebleeds at, at uh, K State games or Royals games or whatever, uh, and never bought a new car in his life. Always buying used, so he bought a used car. It, it came time for me to have one, so he's like, "Well, we'll just get your mom a new car. I'll take her old car, and you get the truck." And so I had been through a couple of owners, and then you know I had it about eleven years old. It started to have some problems. And there would be times where I'd have to stop probably every time I drove it at the end of its life that like every 15 minutes, yeah, I'm having to put more coolant in it or uh, this thing's not going to go. So yeah, I'm having to have some of those stops and bumps along the way, but I at least never let it get to the point where the car just crapped out on me and I'm stranded there. And I think that's probably where like Klanderman is at with his defense right now, where there will be times where they, they have something going wrong and it's pretty apparent what it is, but he has at least righted the ship and honestly back-to-back -back games where the defense has been a problem at different points to give the offense enough time. And fortunately, there was enough time given for the offense in this week's game against UCF to where they took advantage of it. They did not take advantage of it against Missouri. And they almost didn't do it this week either, but they did come through and do that. And that's why like, I, I look back at the Missouri game last week. It, it can be frustrating the way the defense has played in some of these things, but – the offense is supposed to be the strength for K-State. When you have Will Howard at quarterback, when you have some of the other guys that return, like you feel like you should be good there. When the game is in their hands to go out and take it, the offense should do that for you. It should not be on the defense to repeatedly do this or do that. And that's kind of where they were at last week at Mizzou. This week, they, they came through. They righted their wrongs. I mean, they had a chance to do it in the first half and didn't. And then they had another chance – Mid-second half, didn't do it, but they got one more opportunity, and they finally came through and did it. And I think that's what's important about this. So, um, I mean, I, I think it's kind of a game of, of redeeming yourself if you're K-State there and you, you feel good about it. And Chris Kleiman talked about it last night afterwards and just said, hey, like, th they know, we know that they've not been playing their best football and what we're capable of. So maybe it's the right time to get two weeks, basically, to where we can focus on on quite a bit of this and, and get geared up to kind of restart the season. And, and that's why winning last night in any fashion was important. Like, you know, a dominant win like that and what it ends up being on the scoreboard um, still has people in a tizzy and freaking out. But if K-State had snuck out of there with a one-point win and it felt disgusting and like they shouldn't have had it, that would have been okay with me because it's just a team that you needed to get to 1-0 and in Big 12 play get to this little reset and now realize that you can start your season basically all over again and come in with the same expectations that were there for the first four games. Don't tweak them at all. Cause I think the expectations should stay the same for this team, especially where the rest of the league is and, and try and implement those when you, you know, hit the road for Oklahoma state on Friday night and in two weeks. So um, that's kind of how I see it. And I think we'll, we'll probably see a, a better K state team, when they, they face the Cowboys.
part of that might just have to do with the fact that Oklahoma State sucks. So uh, we'll see how how that plays out from there. Uh, any other immediate takeaways before we, we move on to any concerns that we should uh, discuss? Well, I, I think the other the other well, this is a concern, but special teams was maybe one of the worst games. Uh, but I I can remember at K State for a while, um, probably one of the worst under uh, Kleiman for sure. Really, the only real positive thing was a really nice punt and punt coverage uh, when when UCF tried to do a kind of a trick return on us. Uh, but as long Stanford did a good job getting to where the ball was, but gave up some big kickoff returns. That's part of the reason I think UCF scored to start second half is they got the ball on our side of the fifty after a fifty two yard return. Uh, plus, we had a couple holds on returns. We missed a chip shot field goal. Uh, so special teams was was kind of a mess for K-State. And uh, we still won. And we still that that to me also reinforces uh, how well the defense and offense played in the second half to pick it up, because that could have been a major point in this game if if those two units don't pick it up when a special teams kind of falters. Yeah, I mean, the special teams, was it was not good last night. And I think it's one of those deals where it becomes even more glaringly obvious at K-State because of how good it's been for such a long time that people are not accustomed to seeing special teams that bad. Like, it, even when special teams has an average game for what would be, you know, every other team in the country, I think K-State fans are like, man, special teams really sucks. Like, you know, the return game for K-State has been nowhere near what people are accustomed to. And, you know, they, they didn't screw anything up really last night. Now, you know, you can question sometimes the, when they do and don't return balls, but uh, it, it fell on other parts. And, yeah, the kicking thing is definitely a concern. And you worry about it because now that's, you know, in two weeks, Chris Tennant has missed three kicks uh, with the, the, the bad missed field goal last week at Missouri that, again, could have had some kind of bearing on the game. K-State loses by a field goal. Now, you, you can't always – look at a game like that but when you know specifically where three points were left out there and you lose by three it, it just shows where the the highlights can come and I, I mean that that's the deal with the TCU game last year where he missed two kicks and either one of those goes the pacing and the flow of that game is totally different for K-State to where they are still within a score after some of the answers and you know punches thrown by TCU instead they found themselves down double digits and it you know at that point it was it was no good after Jake Rubley had to go into the game there so special teams can impact it and uh it probably gives Chris Kleiman a lot to think about something that he probably didn't want to have to deal with over the next two weeks thinking you know do we have a Chris Tennant problem again and obviously all these other areas that you mentioned where special teams uh, is a concern and honestly I mean the defense has some things to get better on and the offense needs to have the receivers probably start to be able to make more plays for you down the field. Like, I think the highlight on the receiving thing is you go and look at the, the stats, and I was, blew my mind last night when uh, I heard this on the radio driving back, but it was uh, Philip Brooks' numbers last night. Philip Brooks, now I think that they adjusted it because on the radio he said, I think they said eight catches for him. And it, then he only had 42 yards. I was like, man, that's a lot of catches for very little yards. But still, it's six catches for 42 yards. Um, like, that's kind of a highlight there where he's racking in a lot of catches, but there's not much yardage attached to it. And I think that's kind of a thing for all of the receivers right now where the longest uh, pass play of the night last night was 24 for K-State, and that was DJ Giddens doing most of the work uh, when he had it. So. That's a concern, but I do think that honestly special teams is probably the biggest worry right now because it's getting to the point where it is so bad right now for K-State where you can specifically say it will cost them a game, not it could or it's going to you know make it tougher on them. The way they played last night in special teams, it will cost them a game against somebody this year if that performance is replicated. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that, yeah, and – I mean, the, the special teams was as bad as I've ever seen at K-State. But my, my cause for concern going forward is it, still a little bit in the secondary. It, it, the secondary was kind of up and down at times. They got beat deep uh, on the second or third play of the half by UCF. Mm -hmm. And then everybody, it, it just seems like the safeties are crashing so hard on the run that at some point a team 
might go with another flea flicker or a hard play action again and beat K-State over the top. Because if you watch the game last night and, and like do a little quick rewatch, like you see the, the safeties crash hard every single run play. And, and that, that, that causes a little concern going forward, especially against teams like Texas or KU where they will go with RPOs or play action and they're not afraid to run trick plays. So it, it's a little cause for concern going forward, but I, but I do think that the bye week is coming at a good time for the defense, especially to kind of get back into gear and see where they're at. Cause I think that a lot of it is just an experience because they have a bunch of new, new faces back there. So I think that over time we'll see the secondary get better. Well, and, and real quick on what you said there, and then I'll let fan jump in, but with the safeties doing that and, and crashing down so hard on those run plays, and you know, obviously they got bit by it last last night, they got bit by it last week. I mean, it's a bold strategy for a group that I mean, we you know, the corners get a lot of attention because it's a bunch of guys that don't have much experience at this level, you know, getting starts and everything. But for as bad as the safeties have been in coverage, and where you can point to that. You know, Marquis Siegel, he played a hand in, in Luther Burden breaking free last week. I, VJ Payne has seemingly struggled there. Kobe Savage has, has looked a step or two off of what he was last year. Probably a group that should be playing things a little bit more conservatively um, because, like, ultimately at the end of the day, if you think about the last two weeks, K-State's been really good when the opponent has gotten deeper down the field and they have a shorter field to work with. So – I think you kind of lean on the whole bend don't break thing if you're K-State and say, hey, look, if they pop us for you know seven rushing yards here or there and they get down the field and then they're sitting at the 17-yard line, but they're out of space to really do anything with, with, against us, like that's okay. We can, we can stand tall. And that's honestly why holding UCF to that field goal on the first possession they had last night, I thought was really important and impressive from the defense. Like I thought that was growth and a really good thing. So I think if, if you learn to be okay with that more and you're not so focused on forcing them to punt, because again, your offense put up 44 points last night, that should be the strength of this team. The argument can be made that Will Howard is the best quarterback in the Big 12, even though he has still had his struggles this year. And we'll talk about those in a little bit. But like you can lean on your offense and sacrifice three points here or there on the defense if it means you're not going to get burnt as much for the massive momentum plays that count for seven points and and then some obviously in the momentum department yeah i I would i would agree with that and uh i think the secondaries you know i would agree with the, the the concern that uh getting beat on probably blown assignments a couple times definitely on the trick play uh, we also just got beat one-on-one in man coverage a, a couple times as well. Um, one one time ended up being a penalty. One time we recovered and made a great play that I remember, and then they scored uh, on one of them as well. So those big concerns because um, you're going to have matchups with better receivers in this league, especially when you play Texas uh, down the road. Um, and then just getting the eyes wrong uh, again with the with the safeties making that decision Klanerman talked about being that, you know, kind of in that pressure spot in the defense where you're making that key read, uh, whether to drop into your zone or to come up and help on the run, you know, that, that's, you think about playing KU, that's a big concern because of the way that they run offense. Um, I do think UCF does present some unique challenges, the way they run the ball, how often they run the ball. They ended up only running it like 53% of the time, I think. But at one point early in the game when they were, really playing well, they were running at 70% of the time uh, when K-State was really struggling. So um, to kind of make that correction and then force them sort of into a passing team in the second half, uh, they only had one successful rush out of 10 tries before that garbage drive. So a 10% success rate in the run game in the second half for UCF, that's really impressive by the K-State defense. That was a 23-yard run, another chunk play. Uh, it, on, I think on the draw on third and forever. But uh, outside that mistake, the run defense did improve as the game went along and was a big key in, in uh, kind of getting the second half corrected. But again, secondary, I think, is going to be that issue all year. I mean, guys just have to get looks. Um, hopefully they can get them a lot of looks 
during these two weeks off and, and correct some of those times where their eyes are wrong and they're reading the wrong keys. I'll, I'll ask either of you this question. I mean, historically, can you can you pinpoint a year where, you know, K-State maybe had some struggles in the secondary early and then you feel like they got it fixed to a point where it wasn't such a, a big weakness as it appears to be right now? Um, cause I mean, not, I mean, that's just me thinking right now, so I don't have an example for you. So I was just going to throw it out there. If any of you guys that could think of a specific example, at least to talk some people off the ledge, make them feel a little bit better right now about the situation. I don't have a specific year in, in mind, but I, I do think we've, we've talked about multiple times that Klanderman and Klein, Kleinman are, are defensive guys. They, we trust them to coach up players, and I think you know that's kind of where I fall. Uh, this group may be a little tougher, but again, I think this all, also goes back to what we'll get to later: is this league probably isn't that great, and there's yeah. probably not as far as teams that put a ton of pressure on you in, in the, that regard. UCF is probably at the top because of Mal, the way Malzahn calls offense, so we're not going to see the type of pressure on us that UCF put on us in, in making those key reads, I think, in most games going on out. I think KU is probably the, the biggest threat the rest of the season. All right. Well, let's roll on. Let's dive into uh, the, the star of the show last night, the the prodigy of fan, DJ Giddens, had a, a just, I mean, a mind-blowing night. I said it afterwards in, you know, the instant reaction video with DY. I mean, legitimately, num- like, uh, Deuce Vaughn never had a game like that for K State um, from a, you know, a, like a rushing standpoint combined with all the receiving. I mean, he, he did it all for them last night and they needed him to do it. And even though I think the offensive line, you, probably if you go back and watch, I bet they ended up having their best game of the season. I think a lot of it, though, was just on DJ Giddens because he was elusive and he was explosive. And that's exactly what K State needed. And it's also impressive that they did it in a night where Treshawn Ward was not going to play. So it was legit. The ball is yours, DJ Giddens. Let's let's see what you can do. And he, I mean, he came through. He'll end up being Offensive Player of the Week in the Big Twelve. And honestly, I mean, you'd have to find somebody beating up on on some you know FCS school this week. I bet to find somebody nationally that had a better game. So the final tallies on DJ Giddens' night for K State. He had 30 carries for 207 yards and four touchdowns. It's almost seven yards a carry. And then he caught eight passes for 86 yards. Um, 68 of those yards came after the catch for him, and also he had the four touchdowns on the ground. So he was he was the real deal last night for K-State, who ends up putting up over 530 total yards of offense uh, in, in the Big 12 opener. So I'll, I'll let Fan take this one away first since uh, he's got the he's got the the personal connection Ooh. there. Uh, what? Well, first off, what was that like watching that kind of game out of him last night? And then give us some of the, the details behind it. Yeah, it was it was really exciting to see uh, DJ have that much success just because he's such a great kid uh, off the field um, and, and real quiet kid. The interview with, with Stan after the game was pretty funny because I, I thought he was up out of his shell more than I've heard him uh, in, in my experience with him, but you know, anytime you have a top 15 game in K-State history, he's 13th best rushing game, 12th best by a running back, um, only the 10th back to go over 200 yards at K-State ever. And then I think uh, I think D. Scott ha- actually put this out on Twitter before I did, but I, I found it as well. Third best yards from scrimmage game as far as we can find in K-State history, only behind two of Darren Sproles' games, the Big 12 championship game in 2003 and – a game versus Louisiana in 2004. So that's pretty elite company to have not only that rushing day, but also lead in receptions and have 86 yards receiving um, out of the backfield. Um, 40 touches <clears throat> is pretty crazy. Just an, an incredible day, just a few yards from being only the second guy to have 300 yards from scrimmage. Um, so a very impressive day. Um, they knew they were going to have to ride him. But D.Y. absolutely nailed it coming into the week. He talked about it multiple times, how he thought DJ would have a huge game and he did. And he, you know, he really took advantage of the opportunity given to him and, and played well. So I'm happy for him, proud of him. And, and hopefully that springboards him to even bigger things the rest of the season. 
Yeah, I mean, it <clears throat> it was legitimately one of the best uh, running back performances I, I can remember, not just at K-State, but in general. I mean, having th- almost 300 yards from scrimmage it is absolutely ridiculous. With eight catches with for 86 yards, I think we kind of saw last week that they wanted to get the running backs more involved in the passing game, and it really took off uh, this week against UCF. Because it, it, it also felt like every catch that DJ had, there was nobody within like five to six yards. So it was easy for him to get the, the run after catch. And I'm interested to see where that goes the rest of the season. Do they keep getting him involved with or Trayshawn Ward involved in the passing game as well? And I mean, it to put things like really in perspective, I mean, DJ Giddens had 61.3 PPR fantasy points last night. If if, if you're into that, like it, it's absolutely crazy. I mean, it it's one of the things that like that's like a, a a game that you'll remember forever about one guy. Yeah, I mean it. It's nuts. I mean, I you know I I joked last night. Uh, you know, I said, "Oh, is he the best K State running back whose name starts with a D ever?" Uh, but I mean, you think about the guys before him in the last twenty years that had that: Darren Sproles, Daniel Thomas, and Deuce Vaughn, all very, very, very good running backs. And um, you know, two of those guys didn't have a game like DJ Giddens had last night. And that doesn't mean that this is going to be a permanent thing for DJ Giddens, and this is just who he is now. But he has it in him. And he's certainly capable of it. And I think, you know, K-State fans are probably a little bit like, um, you know, not not as impressed by it because Deuce Vaughn immediately was doing stuff like this as a freshman. But DJ Ginz is a sophomore doing this. Like, mm-hmm. that's something that a lot of other places would be losing their minds about. Like, this sophomore just did this. Like, he's going to be here two more years. Um, that's a really good thing for K-State to have right now and DJ Giddens and and he he came through in a big way last night and obviously has has proven himself. I had a this is funny though. I had a buddy in the off season. He texted me and he he's not like a diehard K-State fan or anything, just like observing. He's a very analytically minded guy and he sent me some long thing trying to like make the case for how DJ Giddens could be Big 12 player of the year. And I was like, well, I was like, I don't really know where you're going with this and everything else. And telling me just how like great he thought he could be. And I mean, last night I got a text at like midnight from him and he was like, this is exactly what I was talking about and like going over all this. Um, but I mean, it was an impressive night for him and we'll see where it goes uh, real quick. Cause I think this is always interesting. Uh, who do you think pro football focus graded out as the highest offensive player for K state last night? Cooper I, Beebe. I, I feel like this is a trick question. It's got it's got to be either Beebe or DJ. Uh, it would be neither. It would be Will Howard. Will Howard. Eighty four point three, and then DJ getting seventy nine point three. So there you go. Uh, Cooper Beebe actually was seventh offensively, uh, where he graded out only a sixty three point nine. His pass blocking was, you know, impeccable eighty nine. Uh, but they gave him a fifty eight point two on his run blocking last night. Um, well, I, I read that Will Howard was pathetic last night. I, yeah. I'm not – those power PFF guys must be pretty bad. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm. you're probably going to get a lot of people that agree with you, you know, that <laughs> a bunch of Chiefs and K-State fans like, yeah, yeah, they were terrible at their job when it comes to grading quarterbacks. Uh, again, not the gospel, but kind of fascinating there. That is an easy transition into what we will talk about next, and that is Will Howard, who was questionable when the week started – uh, I, I here's how I would grade the week. Doubtful after the Missouri game, based on how mm-hmm. he looked at the end of the game, and then afterwards, and then Chris Kleiman used the word questionable on Tuesday, and when he was so forthright with that information, it made me think, eh, I don't know. And then we didn't see Will to speak to the media on Tuesday, which is typically a pretty good indicator of hey, this guy is is banged up in some significant way, and. It probably wasn't until uh, you know Thursday or whatever Thursday afternoon after my question of the week had published, and I you know thought that Avery Johnson was going to start uh, that it seemed like the tide started to turn, and that's kind of how Chris Kleiman made it sound like was you know Wednesday and Thursday we didn't really get much out of him, 
and then Kleiman bemoaned night games again, but said, actually, you know, it's like 12 extra hours of treatment and it probably helped him there. Um, and he ends up going. There were obviously some throws that you probably would have thought he could have made in a normal circumstance or should have come through and made last night. Probably three or four that immediately come to mind where he overthrew a guy that looked open. Um, but again, you know, it, they were open in the sense that he has to make a pretty darn good throw to get it to that open guy. Not that he just missed guys like Sammy Wheeler against KU last year where he's standing, you know, 45 feet away from the nearest defender. But he ends up coming through for him. He runs the ball really well last night, 64 yards on a banged-up leg for two touchdowns. And in the midst of having some throws that maybe just missed a little bit, he still made some really, really good ones and some pretty special ones and some important ones on, on some third-down pickups uh, a couple later in the game to Ben Sennett that kept the, the drive moving. So, uh, Drew, I'll let, I'll let you start on this one. Where would you you assess Will Howard's play last night, and how would you handle uh, the people that are still up in arms about Will Howard? See, I, I, I think that w Will Howard was probably in the – he was definitely above average, but probably not in the great category last night. Just because, like you said, that he did miss a few throws. He had the interception. But I also feel like it's a good thing that you can nitpick somebody – but they had 319 total yards and, and really was in control of the offense the whole way. And, I mean, he if he connects on probably two of those passes that he missed, he, he gets close to 300 yards passing for the day. So, I mean, it, it just feels like because he's the quarterback and because he's turned it over in every game so far that everybody is pretty nitpicky about how he plays. But I, I thought that coming into the game, if you would have told me that Will Howard had 319 yards of offense and the offense would have scored 44 points and he only had – and he w wasn't 100%, you take that every single day of the week. Yeah, I, I would echo uh, what Drew's saying there. The two – I mean, the two misses were – there were two misses that were pretty bad. They were both high throws, both of them going toward Bramlage if I remember right. So mm -hmm. I do think Kleiman even mentioned, you know, maybe he's given this guy a nod, but he did mention the wind was worse down on this field. than It many was. Fans, I, I will attest to that. It, it many, was pretty bad down there. Yeah. Many fans might attest. So those misses, you know, I think the, uh, the interception, he's trying to, to throw a ball into a guy trying to beat a man in man coverage. So, you know, it's I'd be anxious to see the the film of that and and grade out who actually was at fault. But even Will, after the game and in his interview with uh, Stanley Wyatt, talked about how he needs to. The biggest thing he needs to work on is is kind of taking what the defense gives and not trying to force uh, some balls in there. Be super aggressive, and and we kind of talked about that last week. I mean, and, and even in week the first couple of games, that Will is super aggressive and is going to try to make throws maybe that aren't there and in some ways that's a, a positive attribute but in some ways that can come back to bite you and i think we've seen that yeah. with you know most of his interceptions but i thought that the, the ability to run the ball i think i think part of that was the nature of the inj injury and and knowing that as long as he didn't get hit in the wrong spot he would be fine um he, he was a little gimpy looking at times but overall i thought he looked pretty Good running the ball. His straight line speed was solid, uh, especially on that 31-yard run to kind of put the game away. So I thought he did a lot of good things. Solid game. You know, I'll, I'll take that from a guy that, you know, is questionable to play on Monday and Tuesday every every week. And getting us now to the to the bye week and getting some time to rest, um, I think, is a good thing. So I, I was pretty impressed with how – overall, I was pretty impressed with how Will Howard played. So I, you know, him saying that I need to do a better job at taking what the defense gives me, that plays into what I said when we started the show about uh, Will Howard PMSing. Uh, <laughs> let me explain to you guys what, what this means. I, I, I started using this phrase probably my, my first year down in Wichita uh, on radio, and it started out as a thing to talk about Patrick Mahomes, and then I could use it for other people, but it's Patrick Mahomes syndrome where – Patrick Mahomes, when he just goes out and plays, 
there is no doubt in my mind that he is the best quarterback that has ever set foot on an NFL football field. The things he does, the throws he makes, like he is he is the most special dude ever. But there are those moments where he recalls things that he did when he was just playing in the moment and making plays and thinks, you know what? When he consciously thinks about doing those things that he's done in the past, it gets a little cute with it. Some errors start to pop up and it can look <coughs> comical and not very good at times. And that can sometimes lead to the Chiefs downfall. And again, this is not like a knock on the Chiefs whatsoever. Like I have nothing but respect for, for them and obviously Patrick Mahomes. Like I'm not a Chiefs fan. I will defend Patrick Mahomes the day I die. Like I, every time I see somebody mention Joe Burrow and Josh Allen the same sentence, I want to smack him in the face. And I'm not even one of you guys. But like he he sometimes gets to feeling himself and tries too hard to be Patrick Mahomes. I mean, I I also see it a <laughs> lot with people like in this industry. Like I, I would always tell people, you can tell when somebody is doing their job or when somebody is trying to play broadcaster or journalist or whatever they're trying a little too hard it's just you know the cliche machine starts going all this other stuff just go out and do what you have to do and don't consciously think about all these other things that could happen and the evidence we have on that the the last two picks that he's thrown the one last week at missouri and the one this week they weren't even 10 yards past the line of scrimmage they were just these little dinky throws into were you know into coverage where guys are right there like it, it's even if you don't think the ball is going to get picked off a lot of bad things can happen with how many guys are in the area in addition to that I mean we saw it last night when he I don't know if he trips over the white line again he has a history with that or if he you know was was going down or whatever because of you know the, the leg injury but when he's going to the ground and instead he tries flipping it at the very end to I think it was Ben Sennett right there underhanded falling whatever like that's a very Patrick Mahomes thing to try and do and I think it just goes into there's some overconfidence that goes into something like this or you also feel like you're always having to make a play and do some of these things and I, I think that's why Will Howard was so good last year was he wasn't thinking about that stuff he just went out and executed and did it now he's had a full off season he's come in expectations are there now and he also knows, hey, I can do a lot of these things, and I have teammates that can make a lot of these plays for me. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and make it happen here. We're gonna try and do this, and I think that it gets him into trouble sometimes. I think the beauty in this, though, and and something that people should take away from this is it, some of this stuff is going on, but he's not doing it the entire game. It's not like he's going out there and he's trying to put on a show for the the full 60 minutes and we're coming in here talking about Will Howard being you know 20 of 50 with three interceptions and oh boy yeah that one deep ball was awesome he had that one awesome touchdown pass but everything else is bad we're not doing that I mean he was 27 of 42 last night 255 yards no touchdowns one pick but the no touchdowns thing is a product of the fact that they just ran it down UCF's throat so I'm not overly concerned about it but it is one of those things that I think Will Howard, Colin Klein, Chris Kleiman, they're all going to look at and address over these two weeks and say, hey, it's its not a glaring issue, but we do have some things that we need to clean up here. Like, we, we need to be a little bit sharper. And I think that's probably how they handle the quarterback situation. But Will Howard is not playing bad football by any means. Um, it can look like that at times because of some of the things he does, uh, because they can be so glaring and, and kind of comical at times. But – this is nowhere near the Will Howard that we saw for the first two years. And the way Will Howard is playing right now, you go back the last 15 years of K-State football, there are very few quarterbacks that you would take over how Will Howard is playing right now. I mean, the first four weeks of this season, would you would you rather have Skylar Thompson's best stretch of games or this version of Will Howard? I would still rather have this Will Howard versus the best version of Skylar and Skyler is a guy that probably isn't going to get enough proper due for how well he played while he's at K State. So uh, that's how I see the Will Howard situation. Am I wrong? Or, are you guys critical of the PMS terminology? No, I, I, I get what you're saying. Will Howard's on pace for 3,200 yards and 24 touchdowns right now through four games. Right the number, shoot, got to get on. He's right at the number. Yeah, which you know, which would be 
up there in K-State history as far as a, a season goes. So I, and that doesn't include a bowl game. I mean, he, he yeah. has a chance to, to have one of the best passing seasons in K-State history still. And that was with, you know, two games of <clears throat> two games where he wasn't hundred percent second half of Missouri. He was definitely wasn't hundred percent. So I, I still is an effective runner, you know, and, and they, they, obviously want to run him some even climbing after the game said we told him you have to run the ball for us to win this game so um i i think maybe fans got expectations too high for him yeah. in the off season and and he's getting the repercussions and i'm probably he, guilty of that too in any but, but any, i think it's normal i don't think it's it's abnormal but he's definitely under the microscope and any time he misses fans are going to remember it and, and let him know about it. But I, I, I'm with Drew, what he said earlier. He made some spectacular throws in tight windows against tight coverage last night too. So I, I still think he's a really good quarterback. And, and as long as he can stay healthy <clears throat> the rest of the season, he's he's going to be more good than bad for K-State for sure. Well, and it's just football in general, but also, you know, and more specifically K-State. I mean, K-State fans – have to complain about the quarterback or they're not yes. doing their job, you know? Like, That's true. I mean, how many – really, in the last – you have to go back a long ways to find a quarterback that wouldn't have had complaints. I mean, Colin Klein in 2012 is probably the closest you would have to not having any complaints about the quarterback play because, obviously, I know a guy that did not like Jake Waters at all, one very <laughs> specific guy. So I know that there are Jake yes. Waters haters out there. Uh and I know how I know how I thought about the situation as a sophomore in high school, uh, and it was not the most mature and best way to, to handle that that quarterback duo. Uh, and then obviously everything that's come after that. So yeah, it, it's just it's normal in football. It's also just something at K State. I mean, you think about like you know the the Skyler body language era that we went through, or <laughs> or like Adrian last year. You know, like. Yeah, Adrian sucked the first three games. Like, that's fair to say. But everything after that, the dude was really good for K-State yeah. last year. And that's why I even – the people that say that, you know, if Will plays against Texas and all that, I, I push back on that because Will Howard would have been sacked double what Adrian Martinez was in that game. That Texas D-line was just getting through there repeatedly, and and Martinez is the only guy that could keep it alive. Um so I, yeah, it's just it's how it goes. People are going to complain about the quarterback in football, and you're going to do it a lot more probably if you're at K State because it, it's a good problem to have. The expectations are very high because if you compare K State to a lot of places, the quarterbacks that they've had going back, you know, since the the early to mid '90s, now they stack up really well for the string of guys. The cumulative, you know, results are really good compared to what a lot of programs throughout the country have. I mean, they've been pretty blessed where you can only specifically point out a couple of seasons here and there where quarterback play was legitimately average or below average at K-State. So uh, one other thing I'll, I'll say on Will Howard real quick, I think also a, a heavier emphasis gets put on this because of the special team struggles. So you think of last night before the half when they're not able to go out there and, and get the touchdown – it looks even worse because they don't come away with points because Chris Tennant misses the kick. Yeah. And when you're you're giving shorter fields to to the opposing offense, they're going to score easier. Like the the deficiencies elsewhere are putting much more pressure on the offense. And you know, again, I said it earlier in the show, like they they need to come through when the defense holds. It's probably not fair, but when you are the strength of your team and you have the most experience, you should come through more and it's going to be on you. You need to do it. Like last night, you know, you, you look at USC and Arizona State. Eventually, USC started scoring, but that USC offense should have done a lot more early to not make it to where Drew Pine and Arizona State could hang around in that game. Unfortunately, they did, and now they, they pulled it out. So that's, uh, that's where I go. Uh, any final thoughts? I'll let Drew have the final word on Will if he wants it. Uh, I mean – it, it kind of goes back to just being the quarterback. You're everything that you do is under the microscope. And it's kind of like the offensive coordinator too. Cause I, I mean, I, I've seen people because everybody seems to understand offense a lot easier, but I, I've seen people kind of hark on Klein for hit, how he called the game yesterday. It's like they, they had 535 yards, 
had a running back run for almost seven yards a carry and had the, I think it was the fifth most first downs in a game KZ it's ever had. <laughs> so it's like, I think that because offense is a lot easier to understand, yeah, it, it puts the quarterback and offensive coordinator and just the offense in general under the microscope so much more it, because it's like defense, like, you have you can allow the big play, but like you don't always understand why or how it happened. So the I feel like everybody on offense is just under the microscope so much more. Which, like Will Howard is, I think eight touchdowns now, uh, eight total touchdowns away from uh, being in the top ten for uh, touchdowns responsible for in a season already. Hmm. So like, he's gonna shatter a lot of records. So I hope that everybody sits back and appreciates them more as the season goes on. Yeah, no, well said. Good way to close that out. All right, let's move on uh, to the to the the ending of the show. Getting closer to the end here. College football outsider time, where uh, we we talk about things that we are absolutely not experts on. We just observe from afar, and uh, we'll give our great takes on. Uh, we'll, we'll keep it in the Big Twelve here because we got the first real full conference slate this weekend. And I said it earlier in the show, I'm going to keep repeating it. Big 12 has 14 teams this year. I don't think that they've ever had as many bad teams as they have. Or I guess they've had few, this is the least amount of good teams they've had. Um, and maybe ones that are even worthy of being in the top 25 right now. Because Oklahoma certainly did not look good yesterday against Cincinnati. So uh, I'll, I'll let Drew kick it off. And, you know, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see the, the Big 12 scoreboard right there. Uh, Drew, what what do you take away from the rest of the Big 12 yesterday? Uh, I mean, you hit it on the head. There just isn't really a great team outside of Texas. I, I don't know if you feel worse if you're a Texas Tech fan or if you're an Oklahoma State fan because – I mean, th- those are both rough scores. I think if I think if if you really like Mike Gundy and the whole thing of having you know your your prodigal son as your head coach and being just like pure Stillwater Oklahoma vibes, uh, you're probably really upset about how things are going there and looking down the barrel of this marriage with Mike Gundy is going to have to end after this season. I think that's clear here. I I think that you know the Gundy thing is done. Um, I can't remember exactly who it is, um, but you know, there, there's kind of just this rule of thumb that that somebody that this is actually more like the the NFL level. Um, but they've talked about like once a guy has been around for so long, no matter how successful they've been, like it's probably time for the marriage to end because things just don't stay the same. Whether that's you know how you have to recruit and do all these other things at the college level, but also just like are you working as hard, even if you don't know that you're slipping in some areas. I think Gundy's probably just been there too long at Oklahoma State. And in addition to that, he is a guy that is in a position that is, I mean, he, he obviously is not keeping up with the times very well there. At least they picked a quarterback this week, but Alan Bowman was still horrible. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's it's a great idea if you had anybody not named Alan Bowman, Gunnar Gundy, or Garrett Rangel as your quarterback to just pick one. But yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd echo Gundy's one of those rare, super long-term coaches, and you know we've we, we really saw it twice at K State with Bill Snyder. Yeah, the end. You know, just for whatever reason, it seems to run its course. You kind of saw it with Mac Brown at Texas, who was one of the last super long-term coaches in our league that didn't leave for somewhere else. So, guys that stay around a long time, <clears throat> for some reason. The, the message loses its focus or whatever. And yeah, I, I do think we're seeing that with Gundy. Um, Texas Tech, though, the, the high expectation season, uh, you lose your quarterback now. Um, that That's a, a tough spot and, you know, and a, a, a team that could spiral as well down to the bottom. So those two teams definitely look the worst in the league. And then you, but you, but you still have Cincinnati and Houston that I don't know if are any good either. So uh, Iowa State, I don't know how good they are. Just you know that game had that game had 29 drives. Iowa State, Oklahoma State had 29 drives, nearly 30 total drives in the game with 16 punts. So that's quite a contest between those two. <laughs> yeah, uh, that was the game where like two wrongs make a right. Two bad <laughs> offenses somehow found a way to combine for 61 points in the game. 
Uh, that's just, you know, and, and the still here that there were that many punts in the game and they still scored, I, I think goes to show just how bad all over those two teams are. I mean, I mean Baylor's bad. Baylor looks awful too. So <laughs> yeah. I mean. they're, and uh, yeah, they're not good. I mean, I'll cut them some slack since it was against Texas. Um, but it's going to be fascinating to see how they, they manage the next couple of weeks. I mean, they've got, they have UCF on the road in Orlando next week. So UCS first home Big 12 game, they'll be fired up for that. I mean, that's that's probably not a great spot for Baylor to be in. Um, I mean, I, I think that the Oklahoma State is the worst team in the Big 12 right now. I put them last in my power rankings this week. I truly believe that just based off the way things are going there. Um, at the start of the season, I thought it would be West Virginia. And yeah. each week after they've played, no matter who it's been, even the loss to Penn State, I just said, West Virginia's actually played better than I thought. And yesterday's game obviously goes into that bucket against Texas Tech. Um, I still don't think West Virginia is going to be able to beat any of the good teams in the league. Like, I don't think that Texas or Oklahoma or TCU or KU has to worry about West Virginia. But it is clear that if you are in the bottom half or the bottom two-thirds, you do need to worry about West Virginia. And for Texas Tech... This is very alarming, and this would this would flat suck if you're a Texas Tech fan because this was the most anticipated season in a long, long time. And yep, you get you get the the kick in the nuts with the loss to Wyoming, and but you're like, okay, let's wipe it. Home game, first home game of the year. It's Oregon night game. We can get all the mojo back. They kept it tight. They had a chance to win it, and they blew it. They didn't do it. So they're zero and two. You get your bounce back against a crappy FCS opponent, and you feel like, okay, we kind of ease our way into Big 12 play, playing a team that should finish in the bottom you know, quarter of the league. And for them to do that yesterday, and then it's made worse because Tyler Shuck gets injured and is done for the year now, uh, they're, they're, they're lost. I, I don't know what to expect from them the rest of the way. I think they can still make life pretty miserable for any team that they play this year, but that is now a game that has changed from thinking, you're going to really struggle if you face Texas Tech to you need to win that game if you want to be in the Big 12 race. And that's why it's going to be so critical when K-State goes there in three weeks uh, to, to just escape with a win against a team that they may be rolling over at that point already or they may still be scratching and clawing trying to keep the, the season alive. The other game that I, I, want to, I want to mention is KU and BYU. KU gets the 38-27 to win. It was a pretty close game all throughout. And I think a lot of people probably will look at that and go, oh, KU, I mean, we, we know a couple of guys that were were melting down over the fact that they thought KU might be better than K-State yesterday and, and all this other stuff. Here's what I would say on this. Number one, I'm not convinced on some of the stuff with, with KU. Obviously, the offense is, is, I think, very special for them. Andy Kotelnik, he knows what he's doing. They have you know, a very talented and, you know, some of the best at quarterback and running back in the Big 12. But the defense, even though some numbers will tell you they're getting better in some spots, they aren't They aren't all the way there. They are still very poorish. There are holes there for teams to expose. They played three weak non-con opponents. That's clear because Illinois about lost at home yesterday to their G5 opponent, but they they hung on. And then the Nevada debacle. But this is a BYU team that, even though they've played better, um, and I don't know what to make of their win at Arkansas and everything, but this BYU team only beat Sam Houston 14-3 to to start the season. That's the same Sam Houston team that just lost 38-7 to yesterday to Houston, who could be the worst team in the Big 12. So I don't think BYU is as good as maybe they've played so far. It's a good win for KU. Um, and, and, and comfortable in the end, and their defense made a lot of big plays yesterday for them in addition to giving up a lot. Um, but I, I would talk people off the ledge. I, I think KU probably is the, the fourth, or fourth best team in the league right now. Um, I would still put them there, but there are issues with them just as much as anybody, and I, I wouldn't, if you're a K-State fan freaking out and melting down, I wouldn't be overly worried about KU. Like You have to monitor it, but and you have to treat them like any other Big 12 team but you don't have to put them on some pedestal just because they're better than what you're accustomed to them being. This team still has a lot of flaws that can be exposed by teams. Uh, I'll throw this out there because you you said that uh, West Virginia surprised you. 
And yes, there are a, a handful of pretty bad teams, but I think what makes this league so interesting this year is that it truly feels like most teams can beat anybody on a given on a given night. Outside of like maybe Texas is the only team that would, would be favored against every single team. But it feels like every other team, like you could be like, oh, they could beat this team. So like it, it makes the, the league interesting and in that dynamic where there's not really like a great team outside of Texas, but everybody else is at least good enough to beat everybody else. Yeah. No, I'd agree with that. Yeah. Uh all right. Any any final thoughts on the Big Twelve this week or uh next week's games? I mean, obviously lighter schedule, no O State, K State, but uh, the slate, Cincinnati, BYU on Friday night, 9-15 in Provo. KU at Texas, 2-30 ABC. Houston at Texas Tech. Baylor at UCF. Iowa State at Oklahoma. And then West Virginia, TCU at night. Uh, in addition to KU, Texas, I, I mean, I really do think that the uh, the Baylor-UCF game is, is probably fascinating to see how both teams respond. But also, Houston at Texas Tech. Donovan Smith returns to Lubbock. Uh, and probably trying to put the death punch into to Texas Tech season. If if Houston runs in there and wins, you've got serious problems in Lubbock, and I think we all have to rethink our our Joey McGuire love. Yeah, if, if the game is on F two, does anybody actually see it? Yeah, that's ridiculous. <laughs> it happen. I mean, there are some games that look Houston, Texas Tech, Cincy, BYU. Baylor UCF, there could be some pretty competitive games. And then and then I think the to me the, the most intriguing game is is seeing how KU does at Texas. I think that will answer uh, a lot of questions either way for the strength of this KU team. If they can go down there and compete uh, at, at in Austin, you know, they won there two years ago. Uh, we, we, all, we all remember the they were the beat Texas two years ago. Texas throttled them last year. Uh, does that happen again? So we'll, we'll see about that one. All right, one question for next week. It's the bye week, so we're not going to get a game to answer the question. So this is uh, going to come down to, and I can't remember if next week we won't get players or if it'll be the week after, but because it's a bye week, one of these weeks we won't have players. So uh, Chris Kleiman is going to have to answer this question for you. So, Fan, what question does Chris Kleiman need to answer on Tuesday? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, my I, I guess the intriguing thought for me is, and I don't even know if he'd answer the question, but since Avery Johnson didn't even see the field, is is the plan now more toward a red shirt? Um, is there still going to be a package for him in, in just a couple games or one game, I guess? So that, that would be my intriguing question of the week after he didn't play last night at all. Uh, I think my my question is more geared towards uh, health because I mean we saw RJ Garcia go out, Jaden Jackson was a little beat up. But I, I'd like to, and Trayshawn Ward was out last night. You'd like to see kind of where they think that those guys will be at, especially RJ Garcia because uh, Chris Kleiman said that he didn't have an update for RJ Garcia at all after the post game. So it'd be interesting to see where he is at. Yeah, I mean that's that's a good one because I I didn't even notice RJ Garcia on the field last night. It wasn't until I went up at halftime and you guys said, yeah, he was out there for like a couple plays to start the game. I was like, yeah, when uh, Jaden Jackson went down and then Xavier Lloyd was the first one out there. I was like, oh, okay, kind of weird. Uh, my question for for Chris Kleiman is this: I've always been fascinated. I think I was the first one to ask about it last year uh, in, in, in situations as I asked about it early and then I followed it up and I asked a good one after Oklahoma cause Chris Tennant came through in that game. My question's about the kicking situation and it, it, he can answer it in a couple of different ways. If you tell me that there is a, an open competition or at least room for Leighton simmering to, to come in and, and get some kicks against Oklahoma state and see what he does during the bye week to, to you know, kind of build up to that. Or how long is the leash for Chris Tennant this year? Because it was a it was an apparent problem for m most of the season, and it wasn't till it cost them a game in Fort Worth amongst you know injuries to quarterbacks. But until it cost them a game there, that they made the switch. How long is the leash for Chris Tennant struggling this year? Because I mean, it, that field goal is way short against Missouri. And then you can't miss those shorties just before the half like he did last night because 
of what UCF did where they went down the field, they scored, and then they scored again to start the second half, and they had the lead instead of it being a tie game and having that cushion there. So that is, uh, that's that's where I go. I, it's about the kicking situation. That That's something where K-State's got to get it figured out. And, I mean, I, I don't want to sound too harsh about it, but the clock on Chris Tennant has to start ticking in some way where – if, if it doesn't get pieced back together and you can't feel confident in him uh, moving forward after the next game or two, it's it's probably time to close the book on that and just admit that it, you got to move on to somebody else permanently because the leg is there, the talent is there, but right now he, you just can't trust him to come through for you in some of those situations, and he's got he's to prove that back now. So I want to hear Chris Kleiman, you know, after having a couple of days to come off of it and prepare on how to answer that question, see what he has to say there. So that's where I go. All right, that will do it for us on this edition of the KSO Show. For Drew Galloway and KCU underscore fan, I am Mason Voth. Be sure to check out everything we have for you at K-State Online, either on three for all of our written work as well as the message board. So be sure that you are uh, a member of that community over there. And then also keep following along with us on our YouTube and podcast channels as well. Be sure that you're subscribed. So the second you get a KSO Show, uh, press conference or any other kind of video you have it right there ready to go and uh, you can consume all the content you need on the cats bye week is here but k-state now one and oh in the big 12 tied with seven other teams for first place in the big 12 you know right where they're supposed to be top of the league uh that will do it for us and we will be back on monday myself and Derek young to uh, give one final thought on the game with ucf and some bye week storylines